Okay, a little bit about the tricuspid valve before lunch. So this is a, a look down at the four valves of the heart. <coughs> Got the pulmonary valve, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve. And if you look at the relationship of the tricuspid valve to the aortic valve, you'll see that it's uh, closely related to the central fibrous body or the right trigone of the heart. Um, the membranous septum is right there. You've got the atrioventricular node, which is in relation to the uh, one side of the septal leaflet of the, um, of the tricuspid valve. It's most closely related to the non-coronary sinus over there of the aortic valve. This is a, um, uh, a very nice picture showing the fibrous skeleton of the heart. <coughs> and if you look here, you've got the, the mitral valve with the aortic mitral curtain here, the three leaflets of the, I mean, the, the three uh, sinuses of the, of the aortic valve. And the, uh, and the tricuspid valve is located over here in relation to the central fibrous body or the right trigone. The left trigone's on the other side. Um, and uh, this sort of gives you a 3D picture of, um, of how it's related to the, uh, to the aortic valve principally. So when you look at the tricuspid valve from a, a surgeon's perspective, the head is on the left, the feet are on the right. You've got bicaval cannulation over here and you open up the right atrium. So you're looking at the tricuspid valve now. The tricuspid valve has three leaflets. You've got an anterior leaflet, which is the biggest leaflet. You've got the posterior leaflet, which is a small leaflet, and you've got the septal leaflet, which extends along the septum. The fossa ovalis is over here, with the left atrium obviously on the other side. That's the interatrial septum. And the important part of the anatomy here to note is the triangle of coke, which is bounded by the septal leaflet, <coughs> the coronary sinus here, which forms the base of it, and the tendon of Todaro, named after Francesco Todaro, an Italian anatomist in the 19th century, which is a continuation, a fibrous continuation of the Eustachian valve, which is at the orifice of the inferior vena cava, uh, 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 cavoatrial junction. And the importance of this is that at the apex of the tendon of, Tadar, of the uh, triangle of Koch is where the AV node is located. And this is an area where you need to avoid sutures uh, because of the risk of conduction block. The bundle of his emerges from here with the left bundle going on the other side of the membranous septum to the left ventricle and the right uh, going towards the right. Um, so this is, uh, this is the importance of knowing this, uh, 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 this, this anatomy. So this is a picture of the uh, tricuspid valve as you look at it. Um, uh, demonstrating what I uh, showed you in the uh, line diagram before. You've got the septal leaflet, the posterior leaflet, the anterior leaflet, and this is the triangle of Koch over here with the uh, coronary sinus down here, the tendon of Todaro, that's marked out by this line, and the line of the septal leaflet. So this area here is the area of risk. And typically when you put sutures around for a ring, um, Generally speaking, uh, if you avoid placing sutures from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. or let's say 7 to 10, I, I mean 7 to, 7 to 9, you would be avoiding uh, the area where you're at most risk of uh, creating a conduction block. Because of the fixation of the septal leaflet to the right uh, uh, trigone or the central fib fibrous body of the heart, um, in this location, um, dil dilatation of the tricuspid valve when it occurs, occurs in this direction. Um, echo measurements of the diameter of the tricuspid valve are generally made from this commissure between the anterior and the septal leaflet. 
and this commissure between the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And most stretching occurs here, but some stretching will occur on this side of the septal leaflet as well, because it's not attached in the way it is over here. This is relevant when you look at tricuspid valve repair, because the area to concentrate on in terms of fixing the annulus is really up here and a little bit down here. And this illustrates uh, uh, the same point, uh, normal annulus and a dilated annulus where most of the dilatation occurs over there. So the most common presentation of tricuspid regurgitation is functional, secondary to left-sided disease. As you develop pulmonary hypertension, it leads to right ventricular dilatation, the tricuspid annulus dilates. The circumference of the annulus lengthens primarily along the attachments of the anterior and posterior leaflets, and we've talked about the other aspects. The other aspect is that as the annular and ventricular dilatation progresses, the chordal papillary muscle complex becomes functionally shortened, and the valve loses its natural saddle shape and becomes more planar. And this combination will prevent leaflet apposition, uh, resulting in valvular incompetence. And that just shows you the saddle shape of the tricuspid valve. Most uh, tricuspid valve disease that you will encounter uh, will be secondary to uh, left-sided valve pathology. It can occur in primary pulmonary hypertension, Marfan's, blunt or penetrating chest trauma, dilated cardiomyopathy, and the others that you see listed there. Rheumatic disease of the tricuspid valve will lead to tricuspid stenosis, can lead to tricuspid stenosis, and is almost always associated with mitral valve um, uh, stenosis as well, or disease, rheumatic disease of the mitral valve. So for the valve to leak, the annulus, and hence the right ventricle, has to be dilated, and in addition to tricuspid dilatation, there are three important factors which determine whether tricuspid regurgitation will occur. Preload, afterload, and right ventricular function. So the severity of functional TR in any given patient will vary uh, day to day depending upon loading conditions. Typical presentations are fatigue and weakness and symptoms of right heart failure in extreme cases and in late stages, cachexia, cyanosis, cyanosis, and jaundice. And that just shows you, you'll have JVD. You can have a murmur, but most frequently you won't hear one. And of course, this is a very advanced case with um, ascites and liver enlargement. Now, with regard to functional tricuspid regurgitation, it was initially thought that tricuspid regurgitation would regress after fixing uh, left-sided valves. We now know that this is frequently not so. Uncorrected tricuspid regurgitation increases both postoperative morbidity and mortality and is associated with poor long-term results. Redo surgery for tricuspid regurgitation in somebody who has previously had left-sided surgery carries a high mortality, partly because by the time you make the decision to operate on these patients, they've developed a measure of right ventricular dysfunction which is associated with poor outcomes uh, uh, following correction of tricuspid regurgitation. And this is a, a study from 2014 uh, that was published in, uh, in uh, one of our journals uh, which shows the natural history of coexistent tricuspid regurgitation uh, in patients with degenerative mitral <coughs> disease. Um, and you can see that you follow these patients out to 10 years, and if you had any degree of tricuspid regurgitation, um, it got worse over time. <clears throat> if you uh, do a mitral valve repair without a repair of moderate tricuspid regurgitation, um, and you follow these patients out, you find that over time, uh, 8, 10 years, uh, there's a progressive worsening of tricuspid regurgitation, and the um, number of patients uh, with, uh, with greater than 3 plus TR um, increases uh, over time. This was an editorial a uh, couple of years ago by uh, uh, Patrick uh, McCarthy where he, he avers that the myth that TR will resolve after mitral valve surgery uh, has been disproven uh, and belongs only in the history books. It may be a somewhat strong statement to make 
um, but uh, it, it sort of sets the tone for being more aggressive with, with, uh, with the treatment of tricuspid regurgitation. We'll just touch on tricuspid stenosis because you're not likely to see much of it anyway. It's very unusual to encounter patients with rheumatic disease, uh, but it's most commonly rheumatic. Rare isolated stenosis, uh, usual right heart failure type uh, symptoms in advanced cases, and in these cases you have a thick uh, right atrial wall when you're dealing with the patients. Repair of tricuspid stenosis is indicated in patients with class three or four symptoms. Um, and repair of tricuspid regurgitation, and we'll talk more about this since this is going to be the patient group that you will encounter most frequently, is indicated for severe symptoms or when moderate to severe functional TR is present at the time of left-sided valve surgery. So this is an example of a tricuspid repair. This is a bicuspidization procedure, and essentially what you do is you eliminate the posterior leaflet performing what's called a K annuloplasty, described by Jerome K in 1976 uh, from uh, um, LA. Um, and uh, the same principle is applied to repair of the mitral valve where you perform a K plication on one side. Um, and essentially what you're doing is eliminating this posterior leaflet and creating a bicuspid valve instead of the tricuspid valve and improving, uh, achieving an annular reduction and improving coaptation between the leaflets. Another type um, of annuloplasty that can be performed is a so-called de vega annuloplasty. It's usually a two suture, twin suture, buttressed with uh, felt strips, uh, not just on each side, but typically uh, more strips that are uh, more uh, felt buttons that are placed along here to perform a reduction annuloplasty. This is this was very popular at a certain uh, point because it's easy and quick to perform. Um, and as I'll show you, the the uh, the long-term outcomes with uh, this type of annuloplasty uh, have not have been shown to be not as good as uh, with uh, annuloplasty using prosthetic devices. Uh, this is a, uh, a reduction annuloplasty using a Cosgrove Edwards flexible band which was designed for use in the mitral valve and is simply turned upside down over here. It doesn't provide support to this part of the septal leaflet um, and um, uh, the results with it aren't as good as with a rigid band that is uh, the long-term results with a rigid band that's designed uh, to be placed uh, over part of the septal leaflet as well. But they're not bad. They certainly provide more support than, than, uh, than a simple suture annuloplasty would. And this is an example of one of a few types of rigid band that have been designed specifically for use in the tricuspid annulus. And you notice that, that there's this gap that's built into it so that you don't place sutures in that area where the, uh, where the uh, AV node is located, and which is the area that you're least concerned about because it's fixed to the central fibrous body of the heart and therefore is not going to be a problem when it comes to dilatation. Another type of uh, valvuloplasty which, uh, which is uh, not, not performed very much and I personally have never done this but, uh, but has been shown to have good outcomes actually is putting a ring on and then doing an edge to edge valvuloplasty uh, by, uh, uh, by performing something analogous to the Alfieri stitch for, for, a, for a mitral valve. Uh, not something that I have ever found uh, the, the, the need to do, but certainly one that's well documented and apparently seems to be quite effective. Uh, 2004, Dr. McCarthy uh, published this, uh, basically showing that uh, if you followed patients who had had tricuspid valve repair out, this is up to eight year follow up, Patients who had a rigid ring, RR, versus a flexible band uh, did quite well. The results were not as good with a flexible band, but almost as good. What they did show was that with a pericardial strip, a perigard strip they called it, or a de vega annuloplasty, patients developed progressive tricuspid regurgitation over time. And this is probably the best follow-up study from the Cleveland Clinic that was published in 2010, uh, uh, underlining or uh, uh, confirming those results, showing that patients who had a perigard or pericardial strip 
uh, or an edge-to-edge -edge repair with a K annular plasty, that uh, thing, uh, didn't do as well. Uh, and the patients who had the best outcomes were patients who had a rigid Carpentier-Edwards ring, not the flexible one I showed you earlier, or an MC3, which is that Medtronic uh, rigid band that I showed. Essentially, a rigid repair uh, gave you, uh, uh, gave you uh, the best outcomes in terms of durability. Interestingly, they had a group of patients who had edge-to-edge -edge annular, edge-to-edge -edge repair with an annuloplasty, and they did extremely well, but they stopped follow-up at two years, and they stopped doing that procedure at that point. I'm not exactly sure when, uh, uh, why, but uh, clearly uh, an effective thing to do. So if you repair the tricuspid valve for greater than 2 plus TR during mitral valve surgery, you will uh, improve RV geometry and prevent RV dilation. And this is reflected in the guidelines, and I'll show it to you in just a moment. Prophylactic tricuspid valve repair in patients with, a, with an annulus that is greater than 40 millimeters in diameter and less than 2 plus TR. So this is what's interesting. You can have a patient who comes to you for left-sided valve surgery, and they've got, um, uh, they've got a dilated annulus, but the tricuspid regurgitation itself is, is mild. Um, even they meet an indication for repair, which is reflected in the guidelines, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, and leads to reduced TR progression, improved RV remodeling, and better functional outcomes. So when you do a tricuspid valve replacement, uh, just one slide on that, you must consider age, anticoagulation considerations in women, uh, of childbearing age and social issues in your decision whether to put in a mechanical valve versus a bioprosthesis. Degenerative changes for bioprosthesis in the tricuspid valve uh, are much less than in the mitral position because the stresses that the leaflets are exposed to aren't, uh, aren't anywhere near as high. But there is a greater incidence of thrombus and panis formation in the tricuspid position uh, uh, because of the fact that it's just a low flow state. Um, prostheses with more than a 27 millimeter diameter gradient will not have clinically significant gradients. <clears throat> so before we go to the slide on the, on the, on the recommendations uh, from the guidelines, I just want to show you this, that, that, that just to remind you what they mean when they give a class one, class two, uh, or class three, and what the levels of evidence are on which these recommendations are based. This is universal to all guidelines. <coughs> class one recommendation is strong. The benefit is much greater than the risk. Class two A is moderate. Benefit is greater than the risk. It's important to understand that class two B is weak. So just because someone says it's a class two B recommendation and they emphasize the two, okay, you need to realize that there is a difference. I think they really should have, you know, one, two, three, and four. Um, but they've chosen to have 2A and 2B. But you need to understand that 2B is, okay? Class three, of course, uh, no benefit or harm. So you've got two, two, uh, two levels of class three. And your levels of evidence are level A, which is high quality evidence. Uh, uh, a level B R, which is based on randomized studies, level B N R, moderate quality evidence uh, or meta analyses, level C limited data. C is, uh, you know, level of evidence C is something which is expert opinion over here, meaning I think so, okay, um, or or non-randomized observational studies with, with, with few patients. So if you see a, a class one recommendation based on level C evidence, you know, and there are such things, you need to say to yourself, well, you know, how did they come to that conclusion? And dive into it a little bit more before you just take their word for it. So when you look at this, uh, this is the, the 2014 guidelines were the most recent guidelines, comprehensive guidelines by the ACC. The new set that was issued in March of this year, 
uh, which was an update, which was a focused update on these guidelines. There was nothing new on the tricuspid valve. This year's focused update uh, basically focused on certain aspects of mitral valve disease and the treatment of endocarditis. So the most recent recommendations for tricuspid valve come from 2014, and you'll see that the two class one recommendations, which we have over here, are for asymptomatic severe TR, functional at the time of left-sided valve surgery. So if they have severe TR and they're asymptomatic and they're having left-sided surgery, you have a class one recommendation to do a tricuspid valve repair which at the time of surgery doesn't really add much to what you're doing, you know. It's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, I'd recommend that you consider using a rigid ring. It's easy to do. Use a 26 in, in smaller people and a 28 in bigger people. You don't need to size it. Those are the only two sizes you need. You will never cause tricuspid valve stenosis, never. So you don't, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the other class one recommendation is if they have symptomatic severe TR that's functional at the time of left-sided valve surgery. So symptoms or, I mean, no symptoms or symptoms. If you have severe functional TR and you're having left-sided surgery, fix it, okay? The 2A recommendations that you have are if you have symptomatic severe TR, which is primary, okay, and the patient's a reasonable surgical candidate, it's a 2A not unreasonable to do it. And if the patient at the time of left-sided surgery has mild or moderate, but has tricuspid annular dilatation, you remember we talked about that, greater than 40 millimeters? It's reasonable to do it. Everything else is a 2B, which is probably won't help. So just to recap that, briefly, if you're doing a left-sided procedure and you've got moderate or severe TR on intraoperative or preoperative echocardiography, it really should be preoperative, not intraoperatively. Intraoperatively will almost always underestimate it under, under the loading conditions that they have uh, with, the, with the patient being asleep. But if they have moderate or severe, okay, and they're having a left-sided uh, uh, procedure, fix it with an, with an aneuploplasty. If they don't have moderate or severe, but they have a dilated annulus, fix it. If they don't have a dilated annulus, leave it alone. Put that way, it's sort of easier to, you know. That's my brief but spectacular take.